Xiao Li is a PhD student from Boston University, working with Francisco Orobana. Um, she received her bachelor's degree in math and applied math from the University of Science and Technology of China. She was a PhD at Stony Brook before and worked at Nokia Bell Labs. Her primary research interest lie in stochastic optimization and theoretical machine learning. And she currently works on understanding and designing optimization methods in machine learning, specifically stochastic gradient descent and its variants, adaptive gradient methods and momentum methods. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to invite her to speak to us today is because internally we've had some discussions of optimizers and SGD and several of us were interested in sort of learning more about that. And so I went and started looking for experts online <laughs> of these SGD methods. And I was lucky that I was able to, to find uh, Shao Yu. And so I'm really looking forward to this. And if you have questions, feel free to ask in the chat or on the Q&A and I'll keep an eye out. And yeah, take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brian, for inviting me and the introduction. So I'm excited to be here to give this presentation. Today, I'd like to talk about the convergence and adaptivity of SGD with different choices of step size. Uh, so, well, why we are interested in this problem? We know recently SGD has become the tool of the choice to train machine learning models. In particular, in the deep learning community, it is widely used to minimize the training error of deep neural networks. However, the performance of SGD is greatly variable and heavily depends on the choice of the step sizes. This has motivated a lot of research on adaptive step sizes, such as Adagrad, Adam and AMS grad. Also, there are some heuristic step size working well in practice, such as cosine and exponential step size. However, there's a gap in our theoretical understanding of these methods, especially in the non convex setting. And in this work, we would like to start closing this gap. Uh, let's start with some optimization basics. We want to uh, solve the following problem to minimize a function f over a set x. Here we consider minimization only because if we want to maximize some function, we just put a minus in front of it and then minimize that. Here the setting is pretty general. For example, uh, in stochastic programming fx is an expectation on the tilde f over psi, where psi stands for noise. Also, it could be in this uh, finite sum form as an empirical risk minimization, where x, i, y, i are the data, and w refers to the parameters of the model, and l is a loss function. And for the set x, we consider to minimize a function over a convex set. We say a, a set is convex if the line segment between any two points still less in this set. So from the right figure, we can see these are two examples of, of convex sets. And for the left figure, some points of the line segments drop out of the set. So they are non-convex sets. In this talk, most of the time, we just consider the whole Euclidean space R to the D. It is, of course, a convex set. And uh, we can define convex function on convex set. That the function value over a linear uh, segment of any two points, x and y, is upper bounded by a linear uh, a line segments of the function value of these two points, that like fx and fy. Also, if f is differentiable, we can see the, fu uh, the convex function fy is lower bounded by a linear approximation of this function f uh, uh, from any points x. Also, uh, an important property of convex function is that f x star is optimal point if and only if its gradient is zero. And for non-convex function, it may have several minimum, like global one and local ones. Also, a stationary point means that the points 
uh, whose gradient norm is zero. It actually covers the global minimum and the local minimum and the points who are stationary point, but not the maximum or make minimum called saddle points. For example, in this figure, this is a saddle point uh, on, the, on the right. Also the cubic function at the point zero, it's also a saddle point. So the good geometry properties make convex optimization easier and tractable, but if do not make any other assumptions on the non-convex function, to find the global minimum of a non-convex function is NP hard. So in this work, for non-convex function, we aim to find a stationary point. It could be a local minimum, a global minimum, or just a set of points. But as we don't uh, like have much for uh, much information of the function f, a point with small gradient norm is fun with us. You may see the following objectives throughout the talk. The gradient norm of the last iterate, like the, the, uh, the first one, and the gradient norm of the point randomly taken from the iterates, the, the x tutor, or the minimal gradient norm of the iterates. And so we focused on smooth functions. So in definition, it means that the gradients are Lipschitz functions. Imagine we can touch the function by our hands. Smooth functions does not prick our fingers. But why would like to the function to be smooth? So the gradient of the functions measures how the function changes when we move in a particular direction from a point. So if the gradient were to change arbitrarily quickly, the old gradient does not give us much information at all, even if we take a small step. Like for example, the gradients of an absolute function, a pretty simple function, that when, f, uh, when x is less than zero, the gradient is always minus one. And when x is positive, the gradient is always one. So you can hardly tell that how far the, the iterate is from the optimal. But the smoothness guarantees us that the gradient cannot change too quickly. So uh, you can see the from the, the x uh, from the, the point zero for the absolute function, the gradient change uh, actually quickly. So we know that the gradient information is informative within the region around the point where it is taken. And uh, a very natural and simple algorithm is gradient descent. So in each step, we move to the direction opposite of the gradient from the current point to decrease the function value. Uh, as you can see from the figure, we start from the peak and follow gradient descent step by step to the valley. Uh, sometimes to minimize a training loss with a huge data set to get a full gradient of the parameters is computational expensive. Thus, we, we just take a mini batch of the data to calculate an approximation of the gradient. Here we assume that we have access to an first order stochastic I'm sorry, stochastic oracle that for given x, it can return a function g x cosi, and g x cosi is an unbiased approximation of the true gradient at x. Instead, we substitute the gradient with the stochastic gradient g. So SGD does reduce the computation, but it introduces noise in the algorithm, and the noise would make the algorithm slower. We can see it clear in the following slides. I have a question here. Sure. Um, I, I don't have good intuition for what the, the oracle is in this case. So in terms of, for instance, like a neural net, what would be the oracle? So the oracle here is, you can just take it as a stochastic gradient. So if you have the x, uh, the current point, and you can calculate a stochastic gradient of this one. Uh, of the function. Okay. So we call okay. it the first order stochastic oracle. Okay. Okay. Uh, I see. Okay. So, Thanks. Uh, so let's start with the convergence. 
uh, there are basically two kinds of convergence. The first one is called asymptotic convergence. So in words, it means that algorithm would converge in limit. It is an insurance of the convergence to an expected point, but there's no information of the speed. It might be fast or might take forever. So we need convergence rate. Uh, that means for a given number of iterations, capital T, it tells us that how close the algorithm could make the gap to be towards the expected point. Uh, for example, the, the convergence rate could be like one over capital T, one over square root of capital T. We can see it in the, uh, the following slides. Uh, let's start with the noiseless case. Here's the convergence rate of a gradient descent. For a convex and a smooth function f, and f is bounded from below, the gradient descent with the constant step size as long as the constant is less than some uh, constant depending on the smooth, one over L, it guarantees that the suboptimality is upper bounded by a rate in the order of one over capital T. The suboptimality refers to the function value difference between the current point and the, the function value of the minimum. And for SGD, can we still use this constant step? We can see from the figure, even starting from the minimum of a quadratic function, a pretty like, good function uh, uh, x squared, SGD with constant step size would never converge. So you can see from the figure, uh, and it will make that go back to the neighbor of the x0, but just oscillated around it. So we have the following convergence rate for SGD. So here we assume the noise on the stochastic gradients have bounded variance, that the noise cannot be too crazy. The bound has two parts. The first one is same as in gradient descent. It does not depend on the noise. And the second one is a constant depending on the noise level. So the sigma square, thus the SGD will oscillate around the minimum within the region, but never converge to the optimum. Actually, we, if we want the noise level sigma in, in, in advance, we can make use of it. Here, the paper by Academy and Line tells us that to take a constant step size, which is the mean of a constant one over L, and the constant depending on the noise level and the total number of iterations, one over sigma square root of t, we can get the second term decreasing with the number of iterations. However, if the noise level changes, we have to change the step size accordingly based on the, the formula. But in practice, we have no clue how big is the noise level and how the noise level changes over time. So what do we do? As we don't know the noise level, we can actually use the diminishing step size to combat with the noise, especially when we are close to the, uh, the minimum. So there's a sufficient conditions for the choice of step sizes to get a asymptotic convergence. Here, the first uh, condition is the summation of the eta t is infinite it guarantees that the algorithm can actually go to anywhere. And the second one, the summation of the step size square is bounded, tells us that the step size cannot too big. Like uh, also there's the convergence rate for SGD with diminishing step sizes. If we take eta t to be eta over square root of small t, we have the convergence rate one over square root of capital T. This is actually the best one we can get for SGD. Till now, we have reviewed some fundamentals of gradient descent, the stochastic gradient descent with some deterministic polynomial or constant step size. But does people use that? The answer is no. Uh, actually, a class of adaptive step sizes may be the choices such as Adagrad, Adam, and AMS grad. 
Can I, can I ask a question on the previous slide? So I think I, so, okay, so here the convergence, you're actually kind of forcing the convergence via the step size. So even if, even if you are in a really bad patch and you're not converging on the loss function, because you're pinching down on the step size, you're sort of saying we're going to converge one way or another. Yeah, so uh, here I, I just like the objective is the minimum of a breaking norm. Mm -hmm. Let's say the breaking norm is like going, like it's decreasing over time, but I'll also say that it might just be the, the side point. Right. So as uh, we don't make any more uh, information uh, assumptions on the function, so what we have is just the minimum of the breaking norm. So here in the latter uh, slides, uh, actually maybe in the, the practical problems, we can make an, uh, some more like, assumptions and we can have better results. Okay, cool. So, yeah. So, uh, so uh, uh, people don't, don't use like the one over small t and uh, maybe some constant. So a class of, uh, of adaptive step size uh, like undergrad Adam and Anne as grad were proposed. So they actually uh, were proposed in the online learning liter literature and adopted into the stochastic optimization by a paper of John Ducci. Is it uh, obvious why it popped up in online learning first? Is that like, is there like an intuition reason why that's where it came up or? Uh, if not, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't know. No problem, no problem. Uh, so uh, in particular, adaptive step sizes utilize the information of the past gradients. For example, undergrad use the summation of all the past gradients and the constant beta then with the square root as the denominator of the step size. It is coordinate wise. That is the reason why it works well on the sparse data. And we proposed a variant of adegrad called delayed adegrad. So the only difference is that we just take summation to the T minus one and don't include the current stochastic gradient inside the step size. And we have both the global version and coordinate device version. The global version we sum the norm of the stochastic gradient and for the coordinate device version, we do the vector summation. So like most of you may ask why delayed adequate? So we actually found that the expected inner product of the current update, so the eta t gt is a current uh, update and the gradient is less than zero. So what does that mean? It means that the update is deviated from the direction of a gradient more than 90 degree. So in the, non, in the convex setting, it would recover anyway. But if the geometry of the function is not well, we definitely want to get rid of this kind of deviation. So instead for the late adequate, the updates would always go along with the direction of the gradients in expectation since there, the inner product is always non-negative. Before we move into the convergence of delayed adequate, I would like to introduce or clarify a very good property of an algorithm, but people may not aware of it, uh, is adaptivity. So we say an algorithm is adaptive to something. It means that we do not need a prior knowledge of the thing, but performs competitively to those that know it. Now we claim that the delayed adequate can adaptive to the noise. This is the result for the convex setting. We see there are two terms in the convergence rate. The first one is fast, is one over T and does not uh, depends on the noise. And the second one is slower and it depends on the sigma. The, this convergence result tells us that the algorithm itself can automatically adapt to the noise level without knowing it. 
So remember, we before if we want the same convergence result, we have to know the noise level signal. And here, when the noise level is low, the algorithm becomes faster by itself without changing anything. And when we when the sigma is zero, and uh, as I mean, the noiseless case, it can actually cover the convergence of gradient descent. So similarly, we have pretty much the same results for the non-convex function, but the objectivity becomes the norm of the gradients. Still, it can automatically adapt to the noise without changing the step size based on the noise level. Still, in the noiseless case, it recovers the convergence of a uh, gradient descent. We proved for the above adaptivity results for the first time in our AIS test paper. Um, actually, the results can be improved. Here, we can find delayed at a grand step size with momentum and get a high probability bound. So for the momentum algorithm, instead of uh, updating the stochastic gradient, we have a momentum vector MT. And it is computed by a sum of a fraction of the previous momentum MP minus one and the current eta t times gt. So to untangle this algorithm, it is actually a linear combination of all the products of step size and the stochastic gradient. Here we show a high probability bound. Uh, the previous analysis are all expectation bound. It means that the algorithm converges in expectation, but expectation bounds do not rule out extremely bad outcomes. Uh, so it is a misconception that for, uh, for the algorithms who have expectation bounds, it is not to pick the best of the several independent runs to get the high probability guarantee. It can actually be computational inefficient. So in, in practical applications like in deep learning, it is often the case that only one run of the algorithm is used since the training process may take a long time. So it is reasonable to get high probability bounds, which guarantees the performance of the algorithm on single runs. Here, we measure the uncertainty by delta. And for expectation bounds by uh, Markov inequality, we can immediately get a one over delta bound. But for high probability bound, it, it depends on the log of one over delta, which decreases the convergence rate uh, by a lot. And still, delayed adequate with momentum is adaptive to the noise, and the noise is sigma here. And for the momentum factor, if we take mu to be zero, it's just the delayed adequate uh, itself. And we, it can recover a high probability result of SGD with delayed adequate. And till now, like we make mild assumptions on the function that only smooth and sometimes convex. But in some practical pro problems, geometry of the parameter space is actually better. So there are some good property we can actually use. For example, a condition called uh, poly, polyac, and I don't know how to pronounce the name, let's call it PL condition. It means that the gradient norms is always lower bounded by a factor mu times the suboptimality. So it is actually a property of strongly convex functions. But if we directly assume it, it still happens in non-convex function. Also, it implies that all the stationary points are the optimal points. Since if the gradient is zero, then the suboptimality is zero. And if we have PL condition, all the bounds for the gradient norm can be the bounds of the suboptimality. And here is an example of function satisfying PL condition. Uh, from the first figure, we can see it is obviously non-convex. And in the second figure, we draw the fraction of the gradient square and suboptimality. It actually lower bounded by a positive number. Maybe it is, 
you can hardly see the gap from the right figure. I'm sorry, but it is uh, uh, lower bounded by a positive number. So it can actually seems very non-convex, but satisfying PL condition. So why we study PL condition? Existing results tells us that a lot of models do satisfy this condition. For example, the dictionary learning, the matrix completion, and two-layer neural networks. And for deep neural networks, theoretically, a paper by Alan Chu et al. proves that the global minimum of learning deep over-parameterized neural networks rises in a sufficiently large neighborhood of the random initialization and the PL condition holds in that region. And empirically, a paper by Klingberg and al. observes that the lost surface of neural networks satisfy the PL condition locally. So it is reasonable to assume PL condition. And in the latter analysis, we have the following assumptions, which better models the real situation of the neural networks and some other practical problems. And besides smoothness, we assume as satisfy PL condition. And also for the noise of the stochastic gradient, we have a more general assumption on the variance. So we once just uh, assume the bounded variance. And here we assume the, the variance is upper bounded by a linear, uh, linear function of the gradient. And you can see that if A is zero, we can we just recover the bounded variance assumption. But if A is positive, it allows the variance grow unboundedly. Somehow we allow somehow crazy noise, which is a very mild assumption on the noise of the stochastic gradient. Still, let's see under these conditions, what about the <laughs> Before we move on from the last slide, could you say a little bit more how we assess whether the variance satisfies this condition? Is this like easy to check or like if, in some particular model? You don't have to check since you don't have to know A and the sigma square. We okay. just assume that the, the <laughs> situation is not too bad. Like okay. you, the, the stochastic gradients can like approximate the true gradient like Maybe not too well, but not too like bad. Okay. Uh, we just want just uh, want to get rid of some uh, uh, bad situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what about the noise rates? Based on a theorem by Creamy et al., we show that if we set the step size to be a mean of a constant, depending on the smoothness and the polynomial decreasing term depending on the PL condition. PL condition is a mu and the smoothness the L. And we, we have a bound for the suboptimality in order of one over mu square T. So we basically assume we know everything in advance, like the smoothness and the PL condition because we need to use that in our step size. However, mu is not known in most in almost all the real problems. And besides that, even if there's no noise for the stochastic gradients, I mean the gradient descent in this condition, the convergence rate does not get any better, which somehow tells us that these kind of step sizes are not the good choices. Now, uh, now let's see what people really use. A very popular step size is called step decay where you start from a constant, after a while you cut it by a factor alpha. An alpha could be two, it could be 10, and alpha, uh, after another while you cut it again, and so on. An obvious defect of this step size is that it has many hyperparameters, the alpha and the T1 to the TK, that how long you keep the step size as a constant before cutting it down again. And actually, there's a continuous alternative of step decay. It's called exponential step size, that you decrease the step size smoothly step by step. Uh, in contrast, it has only two uh, hyperparameters, 
that the initial step size is zero and the decreasing rate alpha. We can see from the figure, it is very similar with the step decay. However, to about one year ago, it is just heuristic and has no theoretical support for that. Uh, was, another... was that something? Was that something that people just like experimented with and found that it worked well, or did this come from some intuition that they were like, "Oh, let's use this particular exponential decay"? So I, uh, I'm not sure who invented, but it's <laughs> in the TensorFlow and in PyTorch, it is is it, it just exists. <laughs> okay. Some people really use it. Okay. Cool. Uh, so. Uh, another popular heuristic step size is cosine step size. It was proposed by Lach, uh, I don't know how to pronounce, uh, Lach, Lach, and Hutter in this form. It has two hyperparameters, eta min and eta max. So when small t is one, it takes eta max. And when small t is capital T, it is eta min. Basically it decreases as a cosine function from eta max to eta min. And He et al. proposed a, a simplified version that only one parameter, like eta zero, still it decreases as a cosine function. Um, now let's study the convergence rate of these two step sizes. Like till one year ago, they are, uh, they are only heuristic methods, but now we provide some theoretical support for them. So for SGD with exponential step size, decreasing uh, rate that alpha is in this form, the beta over uh, capital T to, uh, to the power of one over capital T. Here, beta is any constant smaller than capital T. We see the convergence rate for the suboptimality has two terms. The first one, uh, uh, this time is an exponential rate. Uh, I have to stress that exponential rate is super fast. It's faster than any rates you can see in this talk. And the second one is depends on uh, uh, sigma, the same map is the noise level, and it's a slower. And the second one, it matches the best noise rates under the same setting. Still, it is adaptive to the noise. You don't have to adjust the step size when the noise level changes, it would automatically adapt to that condition itself. Also, you don't have to know the PL condition mu, so it is adaptive to the PL condition as well. And similarly, we have the similar convergence results for the suboptimality of SGD with cosine senses. Here we uh, analyze the simplified version. Uh, when the noise level is zero, it also gets an exponential rate. Uh, in optimization community, we sometimes call it linear rate. And you don't have to know the mu. And for the terms depending on the noise, the second term, it is slightly worse than the best known rate, uh, depending uh, based on capital T, but it has a better dependency on the PL condition mu. Uh, since mu to the four over three is better than mu square. Uh, because the mu is always smaller than one. So what if there's no PL condition? We also have theorems for the smooth only functions. But in this time, we require sigma to be zero. So we require like more refined uh, uh, stochastic gradients. And SGD with both exponential step sizes and cosine step sizes guarantee a rate log t over capital T. Note that we don't adjust the step sizes at all, and it automatically works for several conditions. This is good to know since for SGD, the optimal step sizes are always different for different setting of the functions. Uh, here, I'd like to give some insights of these two step sizes. So under the assumptions of a smoothness and PL condition, for any step sizes, here we utilize a big uh, capital delta T to represent suboptimality. So the revolution of uh, 
the suboptimality satisfy this inequality. So the, there are two terms. The first one does not depend on the noise and the second one does. And for the first time, uh, first term, both exponential and the cosine step size guarantees the summation is in the order of omega t. So they both have exponential rate and at the same time, they don't make the second term too big. For example, is that if you just take the constant step size, it also guarantees the summation to be in the order of omega t, but it makes the second term explode. Um, another trick always going with a cosine step size is warm restart. It means that after decreasing the step size using a cosine step size, we put the step size back to the initial step size and decrease it again. Each time interval like ti could be the same over time and could be increased by a factor t multiply. So the, the blue, uh, blue curve is uh, we take the t multiply to be one and the orange orange curve we take the t multiply to be two. And we also have a convergence result for cosine step size with one restart. It is basically same as SGD with cosine step size without restart. No matter you take t multiplied to be one or a constant larger than one. So in theory, SGD with cosine step size itself is well enough. So till now, we know that SGD with these two step sizes have very good theoretical properties. Actually, it works well in the practice. We do experiments to justify their performance. We compare them with, uh, but not, on, not only with the following step size. The first is the exponential step size the, and the polynomial step size one over small t and one over uh, square root of small t and the step decay and the cosine decay. So first we conduct experiment uh, for image classi uh, classification tasks, including a CNN on fashion amnest, uh, ResNet, ResNet on server 10 and this night on server 100. Uh, we first compile exponential step size and cosine step size with SGD and Mitchell, uh, polynomial step size that's one over small t and one over square root of small t and also add up. We can see that the only two methods that perform well on all three data sets are cosine and exponential step size. So in the figures, uh, they are purple line and the black line. In particular, cosine step sizes, the black line performs the best across data sets both in training laws and the tax uh, accuracy with the exponential step size following closely, the purple line. And on the other hand, uh, as we noted uh, before, step decay is very popular and is very similar with uh, exponential step size. So we do compare with it and the reduce LR on play two in this figure. So the results show that exponential and cosine step size can still exceed or just match the best of them. So however, uh, the cosine step size and exponential step size needs less hyperparameters. So the, uh, here we compare with uh, uh, the step decay one milestone and two milestones. The milestones here is the time when we cut the step decay. So we need four hyperparameters for two milestones and three hyper sorry three hyperparameters for one milestone at at least four for reduce L R R play two, but the cosine step size requires only one hyperparameter, and the exponential step size needs two hyperparameters. So you need less twenty. And also we conduct experiments on an NLP task. We use uh, the Stanford Natural Language Inference uh, data set and employ the bi-directional LSTM of about 47 million hyperparameters. 
uh, we compare the exponential and the cosine step size with adgrad, Adam, AMS grad, BP grad, and DFW. And um, from the figure, we can see that the cosine step size remains the best among all methods. At the purple line with exponential step size, the black line following closely next. So overall, in this talk, I introduced the convergence and adaptivity of an adaptive methods, delayed adgrad and its variant, delayed adgrad with momentum. Also, we walked through the convergence and the adaptivity of two heuristic step sizes, exponential and cosine step size. So besides the theory, we also show that exponential step sizes and cosine step sizes are actually working well in our several tasks, and you can actually use it in, the, in practice. And uh, if you are interested to find these materials in detail, they are covered by these three, uh, three papers. And uh, here are the reference. Awesome. So when you're approaching a problem sort of like a new problem, like where do you start with sort of picking your step size and picking your optimizer? Because yes, you could run these experiments on sort of like a subset of your data and try to just look empirically, but I guess, is there any sort of intuition that you have for where to start and kind of what you expect to do well from your experiments? It looks like starting with exponential and cosine are a good place to, to get rolling, but yeah. Uh, so for like for any RP tasks, you always need a, 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 a adaptive step size that you have because the NLP tasks, the parameter space are kind of sparse. Mm -hmm. So the adaptive methods works well in that, uh, in, in that kind of problems. And uh, we actually uh, see that the exponential and the cosine step size also works well on that kind of uh, uh, problems. And for some, some vision tasks, uh, maybe SGD and Adam always works well. And for SG, uh, so for SGD, so we, we just tested um, like three, three or four tasks. So the exponential step size and the cosine step size works uh, well on all, all of these tasks. So awesome. uh, I think the people always use a step decay uh, in the training, like you just take a, uh, constant and then cut it by itself. So just to try exponential next time, it may work well and you need nice tooling. Cool, cool. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Uh, this was great. Let me pause a minute and see if anyone has any questions. Um, All right. Um, so I guess one other question is, um, I, we had previously had a speaker who talked about sort of like um, other, other spaces to sort of do your optimization in. And I was curious sort of like, do most of these results carry over to those other spaces as well? So for, for instance, she talked about hyperbolic space and sort of training these models and convergence results in hyperbolic space. Um, have you looked at any of that stuff? Uh, at least in theory, I don't know. Uh, I, I never tried that since that in the like, hyperbolic uh, space. Mm -hmm. That the uh, you, you might need that kind of, like better. You can actually assume like more uh, assumptions like the the mm -hmm. boundary domain. But if you have the better like. Uh, assumptions, the results, the, theoret the theoretical results are always better. But yeah. here we just assume very pretty general uh, assumptions. Right. So it, it could be better, but uh, I'm not sure. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your talk. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've wondered for a while sort of 
where to start with sort of the momentum, <laughs> the momentum, momentum algorithm. So this is really helpful for intuition purposes. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.